Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining. Thank you for joining so early. <laughs> it's good to see so many people on the call already. Uh, we'll get started in a couple of minutes. We'll just give it um, a few more um, minutes so that people can join uh, the call. But while we're waiting for people to join, um, I'm really interested to know uh, where you're from. So if you wouldn't mind putting in the chat uh, which organisation you are joining from, uh, that would be really appreciated. So um, also I'll quickly introduce myself so you all know where I'm from. I'm Claudia Piscatelli. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer at Engage Squared. So Engage Squared are a Microsoft Gold Partner um, and Partner of the Year winner for 2021, which we're very uh, pleased about. Um, so it's great to be here with you all um, and also uh, to have Steve on the line and also Yudish um, joining us and presenting today. So uh, we'll get started in, in a few moments. Love the shirt, Yudish. Representing? Representing Microsoft, why not? <laughs> yeah, from your lovely balcony, the sunroom. Yeah, it's, uh, it's actually a perfect uh, picture for a perfect day. 30 degrees, uh, or 29 degrees right now, so why not? Yes, <laughs> indeed. Very good. Lovely. Well, it's 12 o'clock on the dot um, and we have quite a few people on the line. So perhaps let's get started and kick off. Um, welcome everyone to our third masterclass session um, in our series of three. This is the final one um, for our series of three masterclass sessions. So today we'll be discussing how you can equip your staff. So how you can design an architecture to support your frontline and deskless workers and also reduce complexity. Uh, before we begin though, I'd like to do an acknowledgement of country um, and acknowledge the tra traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today. And I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I extend that respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people on the call with us today. So the agenda for today's masterclass uh, firstly, we'll be doing a little bit of an introduction, spend a, spend a bit of time up front talking about why you should invest in your frontline. So we'll look at what the research is telling us at a high level um, and also introduce you to whether or not deploying to frontline is actually as difficult as a lot of people think it might be. Um, and we'll touch on some of the common use cases that you may want to start with when looking at deploying modern technologies to your frontline and deskless staff. We'll then move on to our main presentation where we look at the common pitfalls and missteps when deploying frontline solutions uh, to your people. So in that, uh, we'll have Yudish talking through the steps that you can take to set up the right apps and policies and licenses and what considerations you should be making across device security and identity. Um, at the end of today's session, we will have some time for questions. So please feel free to come off mute and ask a question of our presenters for today. Um, Otherwise, you can also pop your questions in the chat as we're going along, and we'll make sure to answer them either during the session or at the end. So uh, introducing you to our panel for today, we're very pleased to be joined by Yudish, uh, who is Global Black Belt for Advanced Security Analytics at Microsoft, and also Steve, who is the CEO of Engage Squared. Um, both have come with a wealth of knowledge on this topic, um, so I'm sure it'll be a very interesting conversation indeed. Um, Steve, why don't we pass over to you and you can open up by talking about why we should invest in Frontline. Thank you, Claudia. Uh, just see if my sharing goes OK. Um, it's wonderful to be here and thanks to everyone for joining us. Um, as Claudia said, uh, I think there's been a few new people join as well. If you want to introduce yourself into the chat and we'll have lots of time for questions. Also love to take some questions in the chat uh, during the presentation today as well. Um, so this is the third session in our Frontline Worker Masterclass series and today we wanted to delve into some more of the technical details about how to ensure that you can enable your frontline without compromising the security of your organisation. 
but before we get into the the technical details i think i just want to reiterate some of the comments from earlier sessions if you miss them they're available on youtube as well so we'll post the links in you can go deeper but i think it's worth it's worth sort of just setting the scene to talk a little bit about why frontline is such a big focus for us at the moment and i think it's it's uh um, a really interesting sort of challenge in today's workplace uh, off the back of COVID with restrictions still in place for many workers, uh, but easing in, in lots of different places, that frontline productivity, frontline engagement and frontline uh, empowerment has really become a major, major issue in workplaces around the world that uh, frontline staff are the face of your organization. They're engaging with customers or patients, representing your company's values and brands. But traditionally, we haven't really given them very good IT tools. It's always been felt that that last mile connecting into uh, the, number, the, the broad number of people and uh, deploying technology in a way that is secure has been too difficult, too costly, too complicated, uh, and not something that technology teams can actually meaningfully achieve. Uh, but what's becoming increasingly clear is that to actually empower great customer experience, great patient experience and great employee experience, you need to be able to better engage with our frontline. That we need to be able to provide them with technology that powers higher productivity, that increases their engagement with our organization, that drives better a business outcome. It's becoming increasingly important uh, because of the additional pressure that's been put upon workforces in the wake of the pandemic, be that uh, stressed healthcare workers who have had to deal with higher volume and a greater pressure than they've ever had to deal with, or uh, into retail space where there is increasing pressure on retailers to provide better workplace conditions and much more effectively engage with staff to uh, deal with increased uh, challenges around employee retention and engagement. What's also happened in the last couple of years is that the technology has actually improved substantially to enable us to actually connect with our staff working in the front line. And so we're in a better position than we've ever been to provide tools to overcome these challenges, to actually empower our front line, to provide amazing customer experience, to provide great patient experiences, and to be able to engage with, understand the direction of our organization, the strategic imperatives, and you know, connect in with both operational and uh, and more uh, strategic uh, objectives. We're often asked though, where do we start? Uh, large organizations, lots of investment in, in legacy technology. Perhaps you've already got some investment that has empowered your frontline to do some things, but that it's difficult or complex to onboard additional workloads or to empower different ways of working. In our last session, we talked a little bit about once you've, once you've done the deployment, how to then start to pivot and expand upon that and use uh, technologies like Teams and Power Automate to improve the employee workflow, employee experience. But if you don't have the foundation set up, then getting to that uh, increased level of productivity can be quite difficult. So today I wanted to share a little bit about uh, how to design an architecture for your frontline to help and think about that user journey and the ways in which we can empower, um, we, can, we can create that architecture so that we can then start to empower product work, uh, ways of working and higher levels of employee engagement. Uh, and uh, when I hand over to you, Dee, she'll go into much more technical detail and depth about uh, the different architectural choices that are available. Before we get into that, I wanted to share some of the research that explains why investing in frontline is so important. We see from uh, you know, this example from Forrester that uh, the use of shadow IT in particular is really common amongst frontline staff and that that poses significant security risk and can undermine the efforts of leadership to improve culture, employee experience and to engage staff in the mission and value of the business. I know from uh, talking to many of our customers that Shadow IT uh, across both you know, retail, healthcare and into other corporate sectors is really rife. Uh, what makes it more challenging in organisations that have large frontline workforce is that it can become a business critical um, uh, channel through which 
often personally identifiable information, in, in particular things like patient information or customer information can be shared through non-secure channels, which then expose the organisation to significant risk. And there are lots of stories about the challenge that this poses and the impact that this has on organisations uh, that are spread regularly through the media. We also know that it's been challenging that uh, you know, fewer than half of the organisations served uh, surveyed by Forrester provide secure work apps, but that it's becoming easier to achieve. And so, these days, uh, the days of uh, being able to use WhatsApp to share patient information should be over because we now have tools which enable us to effectively provide alternatives. Our challenge is to get started, to deploy those applications into our customer, into our employee base, and to initiate that change, to get them to shift across from using uh, social tools or, or unsanctioned shadow IT to then provide better tools that enable the same methods and, uh, and ways of working using a secure platform, secured using technologies like mobile device management or new technologies like mobile application management, uh, and then controlled through a range of different technologies to ensure that uh, only staff are able to access uh, content when they're working for us within the right context. Deploying to the front line perceived as difficult, but actually what we see here is a range of new technologies that have been introduced by Microsoft with different policy layers that enable us to scale this out and ensure that we can get effective uh, security uh, in place. Requirements and fields. And I'm just going to put you on to mute. Okay. So. Beautiful. Um, so Microsoft Teams looking across uh, as our sort of core platform for enabling uh, collaboration within the front line through secure channels. There are a range of uh, supporting technologies that go along with this as well. We look at the team's policy um, platform and you know foundation technologies that are available to ensure that we can uh, secure this effectively include uh, the, the uh, layers across the team services uh, at the team's client level and the Office 365 platform and services level. We've got different policy uh, settings that are available for us at each level. So the M365 and Azure AD admin tools that enable us to control groups, identities, licenses, and access. And I'll show a couple of uh, technologies that are enable uh, that are available to us to ensure that we can effectively share uh, and control that at uh, at a wide scale level. Then we've got tools that enable us to administer teams and Skype for business and calls, uh, manage communications and team specific uh, features. Um, and then finally, some security and compliance tools that enable us to ensure that we get a high level of, uh, of compliance across the uh, platform, that we've got auditability uh, and we've got the ability to easily onboard and offboard uh, different users as they join or leave our organization or shift around teams, change roles. So we've got the ability to configure settings at different levels, at the teams level, at the groups, Office 365 groups level, the security and compliance level. And the really nice thing is that there are amazing policy tools that enable us to configure and uh, define different tech, uh, different controls for different types of employees and to have those policies apply automatically when someone joins the organization, when they leave the organization, and when they shift across into a different uh, role within the organization. At a high level, the tools that are available to allow us to get started quickly include exploratory trial licensing so that we can set up tests uh, that might be in your primary tenant or in a demo tenant to try different settings, get your pilot users onboarded uh, without additional licensing costs so that you can explore different settings that are available across the organization. Once you've started your trials and tests, configuring and securing your tenant using policies. And the really nice thing, as I said before, is that those policies are available, can uh, once set up, can then automatically apply to staff as you onboard them, as they move into different roles and as they leave the organization. So policies such as channel and meeting policies enable us to configure which of our frontline workforce can access which channels and what they can do when they're participating in channel conversations or meetings. 
we can restrict their ability to share uh, messages, to post or to reply, to use at mentions or to uh, to invite guests. That then enables us to uh, set up teams for specific business purposes to replace some of those shadow IT technologies that we mentioned before without exposing the whole uh, set of information on our tenant to all users or enabling frontline uh, uh, guest access so that we're able to uh, control and lock down that content. Similarly, for messaging policies, we've got the ability to control one-to-one -one messaging. Uh, and for the frontline, that may be that we can restrict uh, uh, messaging to uh, within a particular team, a particular group of users, or turn it off completely for specific types of employees. Keep in mind that sort of balance between official tools and shadow IT tools and ensuring that we can empower different ways of working without compromising our security and forcing staff to fall back to frontline technologies. Look at app setup and app permission policies, really useful for deploying frontline apps whilst restricting the ability for our staff to access apps which we may not want them to, uh, to use because they may impact upon productivity. So, uh, for example, deploying technologies or tools such as walkie talkie or shifts or uh, Viva connections to our frontline to enable them to access key corporate information, policies and procedures, or participate in key use cases such as uh, you know, managing their own shifts or communicating within their team. And the nice thing is that this is available through a range of pre-built PowerShell scripts which are supplied by Microsoft on GitHub, or using the onboarding wizard for frontline workers, which is a new uh, innovation that was launched recently to enable us to do this all through the uh, Office 365 admin interface and to be able to effectively onboard staff, assign them to roles, and then have the policies apply to those new staff automatically. I'll show you in a minute tools that are also available to delegate that. If we are administering that from an IT perspective, then we've got great tools to do it from our side, but we can also delegate that down to the administrators or managers within each of our facilities. So we might have frontline managers onboarding new team members automatically without the need to engage with uh, technology using the My Staff tool, which is uh, available uh, now. And finally, uh, thinking about the way that you'll set this up and roll it out to the organization is critical. So we talked in the last few masterclasses around the ways in which we could uh, configure policies and, uh, and then start to use teams to empower common use cases. So thinking about how you set up the, uh, your, your team's environment for your different use cases is, is really a great opportunity for driving additional engagement from your frontline staff and then giving them a clear reason to shift across from the shadow IT that they may currently use to then uh, use the official tools which you've got greater control over. Things like uh, pilot and common use cases in your organisation help to unlock those and identify the uh, ways in which you can communicate to your frontline to get them to shift across to using teams. So thinking about how you will encourage them to uh, install teams and then, then the reasons why that will engage. Do you want to get them to engage in uh, team spaces that have been set up specifically for the team that they belong to or the facility that they work within? You may set up a group that is for store managers to enable cross uh, store collaboration and knowledge sharing. We may set it up so that you can power a business process like click and collect by having a, a channel that's set up for each store and automatically sending click and collect uh, requests through to that channel so that a team member who's on uh, staff at the time working and, and shifted on, uh, sh rostered on, is able to pick up that click and collect uh, request and go and uh, for prepare for the click and collect collection. Similarly, thinking about the apps that you might use and how you'll deploy those into the organization. So using technologies like walkie talkie, potentially pinning that for the staff that are working within your facility so that they can use that technology to communicate in a secure, effective way within your store or within your, your facility or the ward. Also looking at ways in which you can start to build upon that. So once you've deployed the core functionality using a technology like Viva Connections to build in advanced uh, use cases like a COVID attestation using the Teams app there. So thinking about how to roll it out, finally uh, thinking about the ways in which you'll administer it. So 
my, my biggest tip from today is that user management has really been perceived as that big challenge. And Yudish will delve into this in a bit more detail about exactly that technical architecture that hangs together and how we ensure that users really only have access to the, the content that we verify who they are without imposing significant overheads upon them. And that, that once they're verified, they're able to access the tools that make them productive, that give them access to the information that they need to work, and that uh, enable them to engage with our organisation, with their colleagues in a store or their communities around them. My staff, which is the tool that we've got up on screen now, is a really amazing way of doing that without imposing additional IT burden, taking advantage of some of the new technologies that Microsoft have, have uh, released recently to enable very simple but secure access to this technology. So my staff enables delegation of user management to managers within a particular location that might be within a store, uh, within a hospital ward or you know, other sorts of locations where we've got uh, the potential for new staff to be joining or leaving semi-regularly semi and we don't want to have to go through an, IT, an onerous IT onboarding process. So we can delegate the ability to managers within each of those locations to onboard new users into those locations. And one of the things that I think is nicest about this technology is a very simple way to enable phone log on to uh, secure systems. So a manager can invite a new user, register their phone number only, and that can initiate the onboarding process and use their phone number as the key identifier for logging into the system. You can also secure this using uh, email, traditional email and password. And if you do that, you've got the ability to delegate to managers to reset the passwords for their staff and then to remove staff from uh, their team as well. So uh, ensuring that you've then got a process that enables new staff joining a team to be onboarded really effectively to be able to join a team and participate in that team's business processes, to engage with the team through teams, to use tools like walkie talkie or participate in Yammer communities, and for that to be done completely in a, in a completely secure way without needing to engage with the IT team or to think about things like a service desk call. They're immediately productive, they're immediately able to access the tools that they need to do their job. Uh, and if you enable advanced features like shifts, they're immediately able to engage with the organisation in a way that facilitates their personal productivity. So high level, that's um, my summary uh, that there is a real imperative for us to engage with frontline across a range of different, re uh, you know, for a range of different reasons, not least of which that it's a really challenging environment for workers in the frontline, regardless of which industry they're in, that it has historically been pretty difficult to reach them, but it's becoming much easier. And the tools like uh, the My Staff uh, tool that I've got up on screen here can really facilitate that onboarding process and ensure that you can get them onboarded with access to your technology very quickly without compromising security. Now to go a bit deeper into that, I'm going to hand over to you, Dish, um, to talk a little bit more about how we enable that in a, in a zero trust environment. Excellent. Thank uh... Thank you, Stephen. I'm going to, if you don't mind, I'm going to quickly share my screen. I'll do that from my end. Give me a second to it to pop up here. Um, I hope everyone can see my screen now. So, um, Stephen, thank you very much for the introduction as well. So, my name is Yudish. I'm based in Melbourne. Um, I uh, I work as a global black belt. Essentially, that translate that's into a technical SME across uh, Microsoft. I work across the Asia region uh, for uh, our strategic customers uh, in the region. Um, I've been in security for uh, actually more than 15 years uh, in my career. Um, and um, before we start, I like to sort of ask um, all the participants here in the audience, what do you know? Have you actually a single question? If you can um, uh, just, uh, you can use the reaction button, maybe the thumbs up uh, to, to, so then I know uh, that at least that you're across the topic. Um, have you heard zero trust uh, in your conversations? 
through other vendors or through Microsoft or in articles uh, in the past? Good, excellent. Thank you. All right, so I just want to make, also want to make sure that everyone is awake um, and uh, it's nearly lunchtime in here. I uh, just want to make sure that, uh, you know, no one's really uh, feeling hungry and uh, awake and um, uh, ready to uh, learn about uh, how we can protect frontline with security. Um, excellent. So with that, uh, let's uh, let's kick forward. So I just want to also, also uh, before we sort of delve into, into the actual presentation or to talk about frontline, how security, uh, just want to sort of set the scene um, in a traditional model point of view, what we have seen in the past for many years uh, in various organizations. So if you, let me actually get my laser pointer here. If you look at the corporate network in a traditional organization, everything is protected uh, by a firewall or behind uh, a DMZ sort of environment. So all your users, applications, your devices, uh, everything sits behind that traditional uh, or within the boundaries of that firewall or it, within the DMZ. Um, and we have seen a, uh, a big shift into uh, a lot of organizations adopting uh, SaaS applications or IaaS type uh, sort of solutions uh, uh, in the past. If you think about the global pandemic, which started back in 2020, um, or put all of us into, ex into an accelerated path of uh, digital transformation, and uh, organizations actually had to make a lot of changes, like rapid changes overnight. Microsoft is one of those organizations which uh, uh, everyone uh, started to work from home uh, remotely. Um, and, um, so traditional network and security parameters, what we had, what you saw in the previous slide, has disappeared. So where we uh, where we work, um, it, it it sort of evolved uh, into uh, more of a hybrid or type of like remote type uh, sort of um, a solution now. Uh, regardless of where we are or where we work from, uh, access to a variety of tools are uh, tools uh, are essential. Uh, for our employees uh, to be to be productive, that includes both corporate and also the frontline workers. So tools, what I'm referring to here are the mobile devices, uh, BYOD devices, or any other devices that are internet connected. Uh, so then uh, those people can access uh, the resources within the organization. Now, what we also notice is that with this evolvement that sort of took place, uh, the cybersecurity risk has increased quite rapidly, and um, and there were sophisticated threats uh, sort of came along. As an example, uh, I mean we, we can provide a lot of examples of what we have seen. I'm pretty sure most of you on the call have seen a recent uh, recent attacks, um, and I can uh, put this in the chat as well. The so some of the list, uh, the the latest reports that we have seen. Forrester uh, also published. Um, uh, what to Stephen mentioned, uh, some of the cybersecurity threats that we have seen. Um, now, particularly in the pandemic area, there are identity-based attacks has gone up through the roof uh, globally. Um, and uh, we will talk about some of those statistics very shortly, what that looks like. Um, with that, um, now, in terms of how, uh, especially within the last two years, uh, how the world has changed, uh, around 94% of the organizations are using um, using cloud services compared to five to 10 years ago. So that's actually a big growth, right? So in an average, uh, five mobile business uh, apps are being accessed by employees uh, each day. Uh, so that's actually uh, quite a big jump. So if, if you can see, this is where, uh, when, I, when you look at the earlier slide that I presented, uh, a lot of the employees now use BYOD or mobile devices, whether it's iOS, Android. Uh, so that's a big increase uh, from, from that point of view. And 60% of organizations are supporting BYOD uh, and adding more and more programs uh, to be supported. And 7 billion internet connected devices. Now, this statistics is actually about six months old. I'm pretty sure it, it's actually more than that now. So as you can see, there's 
rapid involvement uh, how we access data and how we uh, uh, and the devices that we use. Now, going back to what I spoke about earlier, uh, um, in terms of the the attack vector has changed, um, especially uh, in uh, the last two years. Now, this statistics what you see here is a couple of years old, but it's still very relevant. When I when you think about uh, what you may have seen maybe about five years ago, uh, attack as a service is quite expensive. Um, if you if you remember the the likes of the target attack that took place uh, about five years ago or five six years ago, the identities of those um, of those uh, that was stolen uh, usually in the dark web they go for about hundred dollars uh, a piece, but now it's um, it's actually much more cheaper. But I'm not going to go into all the all the uh, different pricing models. But what you see here is that how cheap cyber criminals purchase, or how how cheaply you can uh, purchase um, uh, these coordinated type attacks uh, in the dark web, uh, which means that uh, a lot of cyber criminals are out there uh, sort of fetching um, um, uh, to gain financial gain, right? So. Um, this is what we see, and this is a lot of organizations, including us, including Microsoft, that we have to go through every day. Now, um, going back to zero trust. Uh, now, zero trust. I uh, just want to sort of set the scene. Zero trust is a journey. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a concept of policies that uh, organization can adopt. Uh, Microsoft follow NIST framework. So if you're not familiar with NIST, NIST is an international governing body who has created a lot of um, uh, cybersecurity uh, 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 fundamentals uh, so that organizations can adapt and, and evolve from there. And based on the NIST uh, framework, Microsoft had created the three key principles, even ourselves, that we follow. Starting from the left, we have verified uh, explicitly what this means is that we want to verify every identity, uh, uh, every identity thoroughly, and we want to uh, make sure the person who authenticates uh, using an identity um, and using the device that they uh, that they have do comply with the corporate policies, and it's healthy and it's not like uh, rooted or jailbroken, um, and the identities are not compromised. Moving into the second, use least privilege access. Uh, is uh, how you um, what type of access that end user have. As an example, life cycle of an end, end, end user in an organization. When you start on, in that organization on day one, you get uh, some access to certain resources within the organization. But over time, when that person um, uh, uh, grow with the organization as part of a project or, or, or whatever the additional work that you get, you get different type of access. But most organizations do not revoke that access that was given um, throughout the journey. So we want to make sure that the least privilege access being, being always uh, 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 put in place. Uh, so then if, when, and when something does happen, uh, from a lateral movement point of view, there's 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 uh, uh, less probability an attacker can use that user identity and move into other other parts of the network. Assume breach is a third principle, which means that uh, we want the the IT organization of uh, of of any any sort of company to think very differently. Think uh, think about that there's an attack already uh, in my organization. When you do have that mentality, you design and create your network security parameters and network security architecture very differently. So these are the three key principles uh, that we have across Zero Trust. Um, with that, um, with Zero Trust, those three key principles, we have six pillars um, that we uh, address uh, Zero Trust. Starting from the left-hand side, you see identities and endpoints, which are the two main things that I'm gonna talk about today. But ultimately, what we want to protect is data. Data is our crown jewels, right? And based on what applications uh, that you use, whether you use an on-prem application or whether you use a SaaS-based application, and how you're going to communicate that through, whether it's a publicly sort of accessible uh, or in a private network. 
and how you provide network security to, to essentially uh, to govern these applications. And here in the middle, you see uh, the policy enforcement. I will talk about this very shortly, what that looks like and what we mean by policy enforcement. I'm pretty sure most of the people uh, here on the call knows conditional access as an example, and that essentially governs uh, uh, who has access to what and, and, and in terms of how you can limit access to certain applications in, in certain situations, right? And here, uh, you see uh, the visibility analytics and automation. Uh, in here, what we, are, what we are referring to is that how you, from a security operations point of view, as part of your SOC, how you have, uh, end -to -end, how you can get end-to-end -end visibility when something bad happens, and how you can quickly remediate and go back to a normal state, right? Now, now I will, as I mentioned, I will focus more into identities and endpoints and uh, sort of pivot into, into uh, how you can uh, sort of adopt um, both identities and endpoints into frontline work of sort of protection set of things, uh, purely having that zero trust uh, sort of mindset, right? Now, I just want to sort of highlight the foundation of any great zero trust security model starts with securing identities and endpoints. Now, identity-based attacks uh, as I mentioned previously, uh, like password breaches are still one of the most common attack vectors, with 80% of breaches involving the use of lost or stolen passwords. Um, and with uh, workers being distributed and using a variety of devices, uh, unsecured devices also can put your data at risk. Now, as I mentioned, data is one of the key things or crown jewels that we, that we are trying to protect. And 60% of BYOD devices today uh, are unsecured, are actually uh, tagged as unsecured, or uh, could be rooted as an example. So having a secure modern identity and endpoint management uh, implement implementation within your organization is one of the key critical things to drive that zero trust adoption within the organization, right? And again, I just want to sort of emphasize, zero trust is not something that you can um, turn on today and uh, complete by tomorrow. It is a journey, and depending on the uh, the outcomes an organization is after, um, uh, and the budget and the and the involvement of the key stakeholders in an organization, it can take time. Microsoft, as an example, uh, we are still going through the zero trust journey, and it, it has taken us over two years. The, a lot of the organizations that I that I've been talking to on zero trust, um, it's a, as I mentioned, it's a journey. Can take more than um, uh, can take can take from three months to to a couple of years. Um, and I'll talk about how uh, you can go uh, the the easy things that you can do as part of your adoption very shortly, right? Um, now. Going back to the identities and endpoint, and um, we we recently did a what do you call a, a totally a total economic impact study with Forrester Research about identities and endpoint uh, in sort of in a in a more uh, cloud managed modernized sort of endpoint management uh, sort of solution, and couple that with the likes of Azure Active Directory to manage these endpoint uh, endpoints, and what sort of benefits that an organization uh, essentially would get. So uh, organization, as part of this research, organizations saw 45% uh, reduction uh, in the likelihood of a data breach, uh, and also uh, saw 75% of reduction of password reset requests that, um, that they typically see uh, requests from end users into, uh, into IT staff. And organizations also saw the increased IT efficiency um, with 50% reduction in overall management effort um, uh, throughout the organization. So as you can see, there are, um, there are essentially uh, uh, benefits for an IT organization can make by uh, adapting things like zero trust, things like uh, uh, proper identity, things like in proper endpoint management. Right, and whether it's a endpoint management uh, in here, endpoint management, what I'm referring to is purely 
uh, managing your uh, Windows and Mac uh, sort of devices, and also your BYOD devices, which I will talk about that very shortly. Um, with that, I will pivot into identities in more detail, and we can talk about uh, what I, how you, an organization can look at adapting identity. Now, to achieve zero trust from an identity point of view, this is a sample architecture and any organization can adapt. Uh, for an example, you can connect your, uh, your cloud-based or SaaS-based applications like your HR systems, Workday, things like that into Azure Active Directory. And also you can couple that with your on-prem um, um, uh, on hybrid, hybrid environment, right? Then you can also enforce things like single sign-on uh, to to uh, so then end, end users can um, uh, have a single uh, sort of like a seamless experience when they when they access your cloud applications. Now, um, so this is a typical I would say in most organizations who has a hybrid environment, this is a typical architecture that we have seen. Now, some of the challenges or some of the areas that I would uh, call out is that we want to ensure that end users who, uh, we want to ensure that users uh, who uh, use identity, uh, we need to validate, as I mentioned previously, and uh, we want to make sure that uh, uh, end users end up using things like multi-factor authentication, right? So uh, multi-factor authentication adds a lot of value as a secondary source of validation. Um, then passwordless methods make also makes uh, MFA more convenient for end users. Now, from a passwordless uh, options within Microsoft, uh, we have the things like Microsoft Authenticator, uh, then Windows Hello for Business. So this is a great way for for um, for uh, people who have uh, Windows machines uh, to to have a seamless uh, sort of uh, login experience. Then we also do support FIDO security keys, uh, the, uh, well, the biometric security keys, uh, so then they had the seamless experience uh, logging into their, uh, into, their, into their machines. And also you had the biometric capability uh, that you can start utilizing. Now, all these things can be deployed, uh, not just for your corporate employees, but also for your, uh, your uh, frontline workers. When they are out and about, they, these are some of the uh, key things that we would highly recommend uh, alongside with uh, the likes of uh, MFA that we would uh, uh, recommend um, customers to adapt and start utilizing. Now, um, as I mentioned, identity plays a critical role as part of the zero trust journey. And these things can really help to elevate um, uh, and minimize the risk of identity-based attacks. From a device point of view, we will pivot into devices and how you can manage uh, devices using that zero trust mentality. Now, from a zero trust point of view, uh, within devices, um, you obviously, um, as part of your license, uh, you may have access to the likes of MDE, Microsoft Defender for Endpoint, or you may have a third party solutions in uh, sort of in place, right? Um, what we recommend to customers, regardless of what uh, security solutions that you have in place, um, you can use the likes of uh, uh, the Microsoft Device Management or likes of Intune to, to, to have a proper management posture. So when you create your policies to govern those devices which connects into your environment, whether it's a um, a Windows device, Mac OS device, or a Android or iOS type device, you have all those policies in place so then you can govern those machines um, and uh, have a healthy device connect and access those resources uh, within your organization, right? As an example, if you were to use Microsoft Defender for Endpoint as a primary uh, sort of EPP uh, uh, or endpoint protection or as your EDR tool, these are some of the detection capabilities that are already built in um, um, to, to, to MDE or Microsoft uh, endpoint uh, sort of security solution, right? So if you haven't, uh, if you are in a, if you're experiencing 
uh, or if you're going through a path that you are that you want to renew, I would highly recommend you to to sort of adapt. Sorry, not adapt, but to actually to review what we have to offer. All right. But even if you're, as I mentioned, if you're using a third party, we can still manage those devices uh, using um, our capability uh, with the uh, with the cloud managed devices. Now, from an architecture point of view, um, we when you do have that cloud managed um, uh, device uh, enabled, we can also use uh, we can also identify the health and the compliance status of the device, and we can use conditional access. Uh, to uh, enforce even more granular risk-based uh, uh, policies. If an end user tries to access any of these resources which sits on the right-hand side, depending on the status of the device and the policies that you have created, we can limit access or we can allow access, and even we can uh, block access until uh, those end-user uh, devices or BYOD devices uh, comply with the with the security policies that you enforce as part of your overall governance uh, within the organization, right? So these are the primary key things that I want to highlight from uh, from device point of view. Now, um, I also want to emphasize. Uh, as I mentioned, from a zero trust point of view, it's a journey, and it's just not—it's uh, not just going to sit on the on the identity and the and the device part. It also has that um, uh, the applications, network, architect, uh, uh, network, um, um, and infrastructure, uh, and also um, uh, the the all the other components that complete the zero trust architecture. So, in this example, I'll walk you through what a zero trust. From a, when you do have zero trust architecture in place, what a user identity may go through uh, when they try to access the resources which sits in this side, uh, which is on the right hand side. So in here, in this example, you have your um, identities try to access um, uh, and try to connect in um, using um, your identity and there's MFA already in place, as you can see here. And the the devices we want to make sure that these devices do comply with the corporate policies right and when the identity try to access the resources as you can see uh, the mfa kicks in to make sure that um, the 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 well to validate who they who they claim to be and also it also checks with conditional access to make sure that uh, the credentials that end user use not uh, leaked and it's not publicly available in a dark website and conditional access do have policies or do have capability to make sure that uh, these can these these credentials are not not uh, not uh, not public anywhere outside and uh, it goes through all these different scenarios to make sure that the conditions is secure based on the conditions and the policies that you have created as part of your governance policy, we can limit and provide full access to any of these resources, and we can enforce the end user to change the password if, we, if, there, are, uh, if, if there happen to be any issues uh, as part of the identity or part of the device. Um, or if everything is okay, uh, the end user will have seamless experience accessing any of these applications. Um, which you see on the right hand side. Right. Um, now, in terms of adoption of this security uh, or uh, the zero trust model, um, what we see here in a lot of organizations, when we look at all the organizations, there are three different stages traditional, advanced, and optimal. I would say a lot of organizations uh, sit in a more traditional. Uh, sort of model, um, but we, it, as I mentioned, it's a journey. Uh, it can take time, and we want organizations to move into the advanced sort of stage, ideally to the optimal stage. Um, in the traditional uh, sort of uh, uh, environment, a lot of the identities usually sits on prem. There are there could be static rules, or there could be uh, maybe MFA maybe being enabled, but in a more advanced stage, you have hybrid identity. Um, and there could be uh, things like EDR could be in play and some analytics being, being, being looked at by the security operations to identify uh, the, the activities of, uh, of, um, uh, of end users and identities and devices. 
but in a more optimal stage. That's where a lot of the automation uh, machine learning capability could come into play. Uh, segmentation uh, within the network could come into play as well. Um, but uh, I, as I mentioned, this is a journey. We want organizations to move into more advanced and the optimal stage uh, from a zero trust maturity model point of view. Uh, I know I'm nearly up to time, but what I would highlight here is that organizations um, can adapt zero trust to protect uh, identities and devices, and 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 you can uh, easily use things like multi-factor authentication. It could be part of your existing license, so I would highly recommend to you to look at um, whether you have whether it's Microsoft or even third party to protect your end users uh, from identity-based attacks. And also from a device point of view, uh, proper policy management and posture management with uh, compliance policies will help uh, for your uh, frontline workers to secure their, their devices and also their identities. Um, we will share these slides with you, but in the maturity model that we have, you can also do an assessment across your organization to identify which model that you or where do you currently sit in the maturity model? Uh, this is a free assessment that you can do online um, and um, you can get a view of where your organization sits. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Claudia and uh, to talk about uh, or just to check if there are any questions. I think we're going to open up for Q&A. Yeah, great. Thank you, Yudish, and also to Steve. That there were some great presentations. Um, if anyone does have a question that they'd like to ask, feel free to come off mute um, and ask away, or pop your question in the chat. Um, while you're thinking of questions, though, I have one. Um, I'm curious to know zero trust. That's obviously a mindset that a lot of like it's not just sits with the IT team, right? There's obviously a responsibility that sits with the business as well. Um, who should be involved in these types of initiatives? What role types do you often see getting involved in planning for um, deploying modern technology to frontline? Yeah, that's a great question, Claudia. Um, I see um, the zero trust architecture typically uh, sits in multiple business group, um, uh, multiple people within an organization. That includes the CISO of the organization. Or the or the IT manager or the IT directors of the like. Um, um, so you need to work with um, the 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 folks who own the security of the organization because zero trust is part of the part of part of security and how you govern how you govern your identity how you manage your devices uh, and how you protect um, uh, your data essentially. So it's as I mentioned, it's a framework. It's a uh, it's a journey. So you need to have key stakeholders involved within an organization to drive the zero trust adoption across identities and devices. So um, especially for frontline workers, um, there are, there could be applications that you need to protect, right? So it, they could be sitting in uh, sitting on prem, or they may be using a SaaS application. So how can you uh, properly provision them, and how can you properly give access and um, and uh, and validate uh, those sessions are secured? So it's a um, I would say um, typically start a good place to start of would be this with the with the CISO organization, or if you don't have a CISO, could be the IT director or the IT manager type organization, and then work your work your way through. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, any questions from the group on the call? Nope. Don't Quite. <laughs> uh, well, I've got another question for you, if no one else has <laughs> a question that they'd like to ask. Um, how long does it take to adopt uh, all of this. So, what, like, what's the process for adopting um, zero trust in the organization, and um, yeah, how long does it take? Yeah, that's a that's a that's a that's a that's a good question as well. I mean, I get this quite often. Uh, as I mentioned throughout my presentation, 
Um, it varies from organization to organization. Uh, as I mentioned, Microsoft, uh, we are still going through um, zero trust adoption. It has taken over, I think, nearly uh, almost two years or about, just about two years for Microsoft, um, for an organization the size of Microsoft. Um, again, it all comes down to the outcomes and the drivers that you have. I would say a good place to start would be the zero trust assessment, what I mentioned uh, earlier. Um, this is a free tool available online where you can get a view of what your organization currently uh, has and what other tooling or as part of the adoption, what are the tooling and things like that you need to adapt um, uh, as part of the journey. Now, one of the things that when I speak to uh, some of the large enterprise customers is that in a lot of the organizations, they purchased not just Microsoft tooling, even third party solution. They purchased a lot of these tools to create uh, a successful zero trust journey. But a lot of the times things are not deployed properly or things are not adapted properly. So it's really good to understand from an organization point of view what things that you are licensed for. As an example, MFA, classic example. A lot of organizations do have a multi-factor authentication as part of their license uh, or as part of the existing license contract. So I would highly, highly recommend as part of your identity, securing your identity and securing your device journey to, uh, to look at adapting and deploying MFA across your end users. And that's a good start. I mean, that, that would be a, a good starting point. Yeah, that's great. Um, I have a question for you, Steve. Um, why should organizations not shy away from deploying to the front line? Yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's the core of the question, uh, the core of, of our series, right? Uh, that uh, it has been hard, it has been expensive, uh, and so most organisations have uh, seen it as a challenge that was too difficult and too expensive to, to cover off. I think for me, I want to flip that over and say, well, it's much less expensive than it has been because there are some excellent tools available to help with the rollout process now that simplify the technology deployment process, that simplify the change process, and that reduce the cost of the BAU operation of the technology. If we flip it over and look at what's the cost of not doing it, there are heaps of examples where uh, you know, significant uh, security problems caused by shadow IT or having inadequate security around particularly frontline systems that have led to data leakage or uh, compromise of critical systems within an organization, uh, cost, you know, which, which have then led to uh, the inability of frontline to be able to service staff, to be able to service patients. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, that, all, all of that sort of points together to actually there is a significant uh, benefit for us to start to re-examine the tech landscape that we've got for frontline workers, that we can more, more quickly achieve that outcome now using the technology that's available. That then helps us to look at uh, the next step, which once we've got the foundations in place and start to shift across from shadow IT to uh, supported systems for collaboration, for communication, for community, we can then start to look at business process engineering, re-engineering and optimization, uh, which then provides significant or the opportunity for significant cost savings or significant productivity improvements. And particularly where that can overlap with the customer or patient experience, significant increase in the way uh, customer satisfaction uh, with the way in which we've done business and engage with them. So I think the opportunity is really significant and the, the barriers to entry are significantly lower than they have been in the past. It's really a great time for us to be looking at that opportunity. Great, thank you. All right, shall we wrap up? Steve, back over to you. Uh, thanks, Claudia. I think uh, just as a last call to action, I guess, uh, that if you've already started on this journey within your organization, that's fantastic. If you haven't, now is an amazing time to start looking at that as an opportunity to better engage with your frontline workforce, uh, particularly coming out of the pandemic, looking at ways in which we can use technology to better engage staff, to provide 
uh, a better connected experience, higher levels of engagement with leadership and more productivity within that workforce and hopefully leading to better customer and patient experiences when working with and interacting with the staff in our organisations. If you need help with that, please feel free to get in touch. We can set up more uh, sessions with Microsoft or go deeper into your specific challenges and the areas which have stopped you from adopting frontline technologies in the past. Uh, really look at ways to start to realise the benefit that the this new set of technologies and the, the improved capability that's available to us uh, can provide to you as an organisation. So yes, please feel free to reach out. If you want to deep dive into any of those sessions that we ran over the last couple of weeks, uh, they're on YouTube and we'll be following up with a, a summary email for you after the event. Well, thanks everyone to, for joining. Really appreciate great numbers today. Um, and yeah, feel free to get in touch. Love to chat further. Thank you.